Good evening, everyone. I'm UCLA Chancellor Jean Block, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the eighth annual Winston C. Doby Distinguished Lecture. Named in honor of Dr. Winston Doby, who is an extraordinary UCLA leader and Vice Chancellor of Student Affairs for two decades, this lecture is always one of the most anticipated events of the UCLA academic year. It means a great deal to have all of you with us, but I wanna give special thanks to the family of Dr. Doby. I know that you're well aware of the powerful legacy he left at UCLA and how beloved his memory is on campus. I can still hear his voice when we laugh together at lighter moments or in more serious moments when he provided me a sage counsel. My thanks also to our esteemed speaker tonight, consumer advocate and environmental activist, Erin Brockovich. Before we begin, I'd like to recognize a difficult moment that we are in as a society. In recent weeks, the trial of former police chief Derek Chauvin for the killing of George Floyd has led many of us to revisit that heartbreaking tragedy from May of last year. The killing of Dante Wright has only added to the heartache. I hope the conviction in the Chauvin trial brings a measure of accountability for this terrible crime. But we also know that it will take more than one verdict to resolve the deeper issues our country faces. Honoring Dr. Doby, honoring what he stood for and what he built, and honoring UCLA's own mission all requires that we remain committed to challenging racial bias and creating a world of equity and opportunity for all. Core to UCLA's work in trying to create that world has been the Academic Advancement Program, which is presenting today's event. AAP was founded by Dr. Doby himself and is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. The dedication of the program staff, the hard work of UCLA faculty, and the support of our Black alumni have made AAP the nation's largest university-based diversity program, serving approximately 5,000 students. The success of AAP program today is largely due to the vision, leadership, and commitment of Dr. Charles Alexander, UCLA's Associate Vice Provost for Student Diversity and AAP's Director. Nobody on campus has done more to advance Winston Doby's vision of UCLA as a place of genuine inclusion and to extend its promise of opportunity, transformation, and empowerment. I am grateful to have him as a colleague and pleased to turn the program over to him. Thank you. Good evening and thank you, Chancellor Block, for those kind words. And again, without the support of the UCLA community, our faculty and our staff in AAP, the work that I do would not be easily accomplished as you, as you outlined. But I'm very proud and happy that uh, we can be here this evening celebrating this wonderful occasion and this distinguished lecture series that we put on annually. Again, I'm Charles Alexander. I'm the Associate Vice Provost for Student Diversity and Director of UCLA's Academic Advancement Program. Each year, we invite distinguished thinkers from across the country to address our community on topics related to higher education and various issues that re re revolves around social justice, issues that Dr. Doby would passionately advocate for and advocated for throughout his career and his life. And so today we are really here to honor Dr. Doby's legacy, one that continues to be felt on our campus. Dr. Doby believed that the best way to improve the lives of first generation, low income and under, underrepresented students was to provide them with an educational experience where no one was left behind. His crowning achievement at UCLA, as you heard, was the creation of the Academic Advancement Program, otherwise known as AAP. Again, one of the first university-based student diversity programs and this year celebrating its 50th anniversary, which will include elevated annual programming. Our program also will include speakers and ending with hopefully a successful spark giving campaign at the end of the year. Today, AAP provides thousands of our students with the educational resources necessary to ensure that they will have what they need to build a better future for themselves and for their families, as well as their communities. Amidst the pandemic, we've continued to provide the resources 
that our students need to succeed and survive in this challenging environment. Finally, I can't think of a better way to honor Dr. Winston Dovey's legacy and to continue fulfilling his dream for social justice than to welcome Aaron Brockovich to be our keynote featured speaker. I suspect that had they met, these two remarkable and courageous people would have certainly drawn inspiration from one another. So I hope you enjoy today's program and I hope you continue to engage with our campus and particularly with AAP for many years to come. Now I would like to take the pleasure of introducing Marilyn Raphael, who will introduce Ms. Erin Brockovic. Uh, Marilyn Ra Raphael is a professor of geography at UCLA and is also the new interim director of the US UCLA Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. Professor Raphael. Thank you, Dr. Alexander. It's my honor to be here with you today for this important and exciting annual event for the Academic Advancement Program honoring Dr. Winston C. Dobie. And it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker. Say the name Erin Brockovich, and people think of the Oscar-winning movie starring Julia Roberts, the film that turned this previously unknown legal researcher into a 20th century icon. It was Erin's dogged persistence and stick to itiveness that was the impelling force behind the largest medical settlement lawsuit in history. Since then, she has not rested on her laurels. She continues to fight hard and to win big. Erin has not been working only with water pollution. She is a consumer advocate working on disease clusters, fracking, medical devices, environmental disasters, and more. She thrives on being the voice for those who don't know how to yell. She's a rebel, a fighter, a mother. Because of her fighting spirit, Erin has become the champion of countless men and women. She travels the world for personal appearances to help spread her message of empowerment. As president of Brogovich Research and Consulting, she is currently involved in numerous environmental projects worldwide. These range from continued efforts to help clean up water to helping veterans. In 2020, her book, Superman's Not Coming, was published. It is Erin's deep dive into America's water crisis and a call to action for the heroes within all of us. This book is also now a podcast. Erin is a true American hero whose determination only fuels her desire to expose injustice and to lend her voice to those that do not have one. Please join me in welcoming our eighth annual Winston C. Doby Lectures featured speaker, Erin Brockovich, and moderator for the evening, Dean Adriana Galvin. Hello, everyone. It's nice to be here, my gosh, what a beautiful introduction. And it is such a privilege and an honor to have this time with all of you tonight. I'm Erin Brockovich, not Julie Roberts. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Erin, can I call you Erin? Absolutely. <laughs> great. My name is Adriana Galvan. Thank you so much, Marilyn, for that great introduction. I'm so honored and happy to be here today. And, you know, Erin, I, I, I know we've all said it, but we just are so grateful that you're here honoring Winston C. Doby, you heard how impactful he has been and he was on our campus and really in the world. And, um, and so have you been impactful in our world and in, 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 at UCLA. So um, just to everyone listening tonight, we will now start the main portion of our program where we are in conversation with Aaron Brockovich um, through students submitted questions and live questions in time, if time permits. And um, I just want to say that if you have a question for Aaron, please use the Q&A box to submit. But I have to say, I have my own questions for you. And I thought we would start way at the beginning. You have had such a celebrated and storied career. And I, I'm, I'm just curious about what and who inspired <laughs> you to become a social justice advocate. Oh my gosh, 
You've taken me back in time, mm -hmm. dating me already. No, <laughs> so um, my love came for the environment at a very, 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 very young age. Anytime, anywhere, you would usually find me outside. I was just fascinated with my surroundings. Uh, fireflies, you know, how do they work? Watching thunderstorms, um, the magic of snowfall and running around as a child and catching it on my tongue and going down to the rivers and the creeks and the tadpoles, just everything about it amazed me. And I felt very embraced by the environment and very accepted by the environment. And why I was outside often is school was very difficult for me because I'm a dyslexic. So it was oftentimes a source of frustration. I knew I knew, but I couldn't express myself. I felt very closed in. Um, I felt that I was always labeled and I was perceived as different. And, you know, I always thought individualism and different was good, but I was always placed over here. Yeah. So because of that, I found myself being accepted in the environment and, and I was very happy and I flourished there. So it was just in me from day one, my connection to the environment and my inspiration getting through all of that was certainly my mom and my dad who was born and raised in the Midwest. My mom was a journalist. I think that's why I'm Snoopy. My dad was an engineer. He actually ran the pipelines for Citigroup, and he used to sing me songs about water and watch it trickling down the stream, enjoy it today for someday it might not be seen. Mm -hmm. He would tell me things about how in my lifetime it could be a commodity or we would have none, and that all just struck me very, very deeply. And another one of my great mentors, has, as I hope everyone knows, I think they do, is Rachel Carson, and especially her book on Silent Springs. So that's kind of going back and where my beginnings started, where my frustrations were and where my love from the environment came from. Isn't it fascinating that things that we are drawn to are really rooted in our childhood and, and where we are developmentally. I think about that. I'm a developmental neuroscientist and I think a lot about how our experiences as young people really shape what we um, want to pursue as adults. And so now that you've been in this career and this advocate for so long, what inspires you to keep advocating given all the different things that we could advocate for? Why is it that environmental justice is really still at the forefront for you? Um, the environmental justice for me represents everything. We are the environment and the environment is us. And you brought up something interesting there about, you know, um, how interesting it is, you know, what happens to us as a child. And one thing that also stuck out with me that seems to be, for me, one of the most important messages that, that I want to share, and I've learned it in my communities. As I said, being a dyslexic, um, my, my peers, um, I was perceived different, and I oftentimes felt teased, or I, because of that, um, I was labeled. Nobody likes that. And it got to a point where I was afraid to raise my hand. And this is what I have seen in communities that happens to them as well. And frankly, it can happen to every single one of us. And we pull back. And I recognize that. And I want to bring you in because Understanding and believing and getting behind yourself and your self-esteem is critical that it doesn't slide away from us. And my inspiration came from the environment so much so um, as it embraced me that I began to recognize um, how the system of nature worked and where we were moving away from that and where our systems were failing us. And we were failing not only the environment or our friends or neighbor, but actually ourself. Mm -hmm. And I want everyone out there to know there, there will always be a naysayer or somebody else that has a perception of who it is you are. But I, for me, it feels like Velcro getting stuck on me and I, I need to pull it off and be who we are 
And sometimes we are afraid of that and nothing could be worse um, than moving away from who you are and believing in who you are and finding your courage and not being afraid to be different or vulnerable or flawed. Those are the specialist qualities about you that I hope you learn to embrace. And I have learned and seen that throughout this world in all communities that when we come together like that, again, I will relate so much to nature. It's like when the tide comes in, it doesn't raise one ship, it raises all ships. You're absolutely right. And I think I think you're so right that sometimes the things that we think are are our limitations are actually what propel us forward, right? Because that's what we work on. That's what we want other people to see us advance in and, and succeed in. And um, you know, I, I agree with you that sometimes that it's really things that we find so important that we advocate for, even if we're un uncertain about, about the path forward. So in yes. all the time that you have been an advocate for environmental issues, what, have, what changes have you seen that are both either positive or negative since this work began for you? I, wow, there's a couple of places to begin. Eight years ago, and I'm the first person to tell you, I'm all kinds of issues. <laughs> I'm a hot mess sometimes. <laughs> and <laughs> are we all? Um, I get, I'm human and I get tired and I get frustrated and I can feel that I'm not breaking through um, and we're, that we're not making progress. Um, what is really changing? I see firsthand the destruction to the environment. And this is this has been going on for decades. It's been an erosion. And again, I will relate so much back to the environment. And you know, just like waves crashing on cliffs and rock, it can peel back layers and the erosion, and you can begin to see beneath the rock. I think that this has been happening, and we are in a great wake-up call. We are in a great reset. We are in a reboot where we've been able to, COVID stopped us, to stop and see the erosion and what's really beneath the rock and how far have we progressed. Mm -hmm. And I felt stuck eight years ago. What renewed me and what I, I hope to leave tonight is, is a question that we all ask. What is the legacy we leave? Mm -hmm. And my granddaughter, my first granddaughter was born and I got to catch her. <laughs> and this was- Wow, that's exciting. This, it was, it, it just, the, it was a, a rebirth for me at that very moment. Yes, this is why, even though there's so much failures in the system, when the moment happens, it reinvigorates you. And we're here now. I believe the best moments for us in this world are yet to come because what we have woken up to and seen and realized all because we stopped. We've been very busy. This world spins pretty fast and we're all caught up in that. And like the great computer that we are all on, when all the data comes in and it can't process it, it poof, it's yeah. down. Yeah. And I see that's, that's what has happened to us. And for as difficult and heart-wrenching and eye-opening and agonizing, it's been a moment that we finally see and we finally hear and the conversation begins and we so, stop right and we listen and we think about and we have nothing to do but reflect on what this moment means for us whether you are a grand a new grandmother or a parent or a student or an educator what does it mean to have to evaluate what you've been doing and going so fast in all this time i completely agree with you and you yeah. know our, our our um of course our administration has changed so much during this time and oh, very much. Um, there's been such a shift, obviously, in the past few months. And as you are such a strong voice on issues related to the environment, what message would you give this new administration, the Biden administration, 
if you could share one thing with them, and they've probably already asked you, right? What do we do? <laughs> Aaron, <laughs> what do we do with the environment right now? What do you say to them? Um, not seeing and or division and how much it hurts us. I get very, very frustrated. Um, it, it's, it's not right or left, it's right or wrong. We see it and it's the action that we take and all of the division and going back and forth has gotten us nowhere and how important it is to bring us together and we're learning the importance of that. I feel even tonight, I so miss and wish to be together with all of you and how to, to, to stop the argument on either side and the, the bigger picture of the collective of the whole that exists within the people in the environment um, to never give up on that to that is always worth fighting for and standing up for and that we stay that course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and stay the course. And I think one of the most opportune times to bring people into that conversation, into that sentiment of not giving up is when people are young adults and when they are transitioning into, and into who they will be and exploring their own identity. And we know that college students are perfect for that. They they mm -hmm. they seek out passion that they didn't know they had and causes that they didn't know they believed in. And so, what is the easiest <clears throat> way for college students to become advocates for social justice in their community, for for the environment, for whatever it is that they that they care about? How can they do that? Well, yeah, I have kids of my own, <clears throat> and. Um... I understand and I've been there, done that. What I have learned and with even if all my challenges is you can't give up. I, I'm gonna bring up my mom's favorite word and I love words. Um, I think some <clears throat> definition of our words need to change. You know, I'm one that talks about looking at our infrastructures and, and how they, they are failing over time. And, we have to look at policies and laws and failed over time. We've grown up as a society and we, we are expanding, we are evolving and, and I do that every day. And I want the, the youth to understand that there, there will always be roadblocks, but don't give, never, never give up. Take a break if you need to, because believe me, I do. I throw myself down on the floor and just had a good old cry. And, but you've got to get back in the game. It makes me think of two things. My mom, who taught me the power of a word, like I said, words are fun to play around with, is called stick to -itiveness. Now, I feel really silly. I know I'm talking to a group of very well-educated at a phenomenal university, staff and students and, and everybody, but it's such a powerful word. I rolled my eyes when my mom told me, you've got to have some stick to it in this, Aaron, because I didn't think it was a word. And she returned with the Webster's Dictionary and his definition, a propensity to follow through in a determined manner. Yeah. Dogged persistence born of obligation and stubbornness. Yeah. Oh, I understood this. Stubborn's my middle name. I'm dogged, I'm determined. And so any time that you feel down or want to give up or want to quit, remember that word. And I think of it in our lives somewhat in this way. It's the Super Bowl. And you know, and you, as a player and a team member, you come in that you might get knocked back 20 yards. But here's the thing, you might pick up 30. And then when you come back and you meet with the team, it's that support that you get together and you know in the game, you might get knocked down, but here's what you do know in the game. You always get back up and you never lose sight of that goal. And even if it takes 10 yards and then 10 yards and 10 yards, keep pushing forward, pick it back up, allow yourself to feel defeated, but never give up. And I promise you, I promise you, you're going to make that touchdown. Yeah, that's right. 
That's right. Even when you feel like it's not, it's not going to happen. I mean, you have to believe so much in the cause that you were believe that you were working for, right? To keep working for it. And so, how do you? What motivates you when you're feeling in those moments of despair? And what am I doing this for? Why does it matter what I'm doing? What motivates you to seek justice for other people and for the environment? Um, I love people. I love the environment. You know we are water <laughs> and, the, and the environment is water. And if we don't and aren't there for others and we don't protect and defend our lives, it, it, it really in turn destroys us. And, and I don't know why we would do that. So I look to others, I listen, I listen. I have compassion, I have empathy, you know, and oftentimes when we're listening and people are speaking with us, I don't think they expect us to fix it, but they need that support. That's the game changer. And I don't know if I'm, boy, my mind's going all over the place because I have a bunch of stories. I have the gift of gab so I could, you know, jet all over here with you this way. Um, <laughs> but it, it is the people. Um, it is my children, it is my grandchildren, it is the environment that that keeps, <laughs> it's, it's life. When we give to others, we empower not only them, them, but ourselves as well. And it helps us feel good to give. And so I'm always motivated when I'm in my communities with the people down in the environment. I don't wanna be disconnected from that. Um, because that's, that's where you see life and that's where you learn patience and tolerance mm -hmm. and kindness and acceptance and forgiveness and everything else. And all the things you need to advocate for other people, right? Oh, absolutely. It becomes, it's, it's like contagious. You yeah. know, you're like, yes, I want to be a part of it. Right, and right, exactly. And, and that and that is what keeps me going. But that doesn't mean, and I'm not going to sit here and, and tell you, you know, everything's always hunky dory. There's days where, I, the, look, I have to mind myself tonight. It's just, you know, pan gesture moments where I'm so frustrated that, you know, I I just sometimes feel like I'm I'm going to lose it. But again, we beat ourselves up for making mistakes and I want everyone to know that that's okay I, I I worry so much that we need to see our past and and it's it's here and then we angst about tomorrow to be present this is what I think is the greatest gift for all of us right now yeah. is to be present yeah. um and I think about leadership all the time mm -hmm. I do and we have this idea of what a leader is supposed to mean. And I don't know if it's stoic or stern and a lot of things would come to my mind, but true leadership is the qualities that we talked about. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that is patience, tolerance, kindness, for forgiveness. All of the things that I think at some time we've learned that maybe means you're weak. Oh, no, 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 no. Those are your greatest strengths. Yeah. I agree completely. As I mentioned before, Chancellor Balk and I earlier today were, were meeting with students about leadership and what makes a good leader and how does a leader persevere despite the many voices that, that come at you and, and the different mm -hmm. opinions. And so I'm gonna ask you a practical question for our students who I know are listening right now is for students pursuing a career in advocacy or environmental issues or just um, making the, their surroundings better. What is, what's the best path forward? For them uh, getting yeah. into uh, advocacy? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It begins with you. Um, I talk about or teach, if you will, um, about becoming the ram. Again, I'm going to go to nature um, that in its confidence has moments on a cliff that it feels unsteady or how it's going to get down. And it does it because it trusts itself. This is something that I find that's really important to realize 
assess and motivate oneself. So oftentimes we think someone's standing in our way from getting involved or being that advocate or making that change. But oftentimes the only person standing in your way is you because you doubt you. And it's about realizing who you are and looking at that person in the mirror and you yourself embracing, hey, this is what I am and it may not be perfect. And I am kind, I am good. I, am, I can be that leader. You have to believe that. You have to find that courage. You feel it, you know it, and you have to, to push away the naysayers. They're always going to be out there. There's always going to be something negative. But you can see yourself. I encourage them to reassess who you are. And oftentimes we won't do that. But I think of it, I don't know, of real estate, let's say. You sell your house and the appraisal comes in, not what you thought. But so you go in and make some changes, right? Yeah. And that's the beauty. We can choose to make a change. We can choose to go back to school. We can choose what path we take. And that's very empowering to make your choice. I think of it as the butterfly. So the caterpillar must dissect itself in order to morph yeah. into the butterfly. So not to be afraid to look within. And mostly it's about our motivation and that is time for self-renewal. And so it all begins. I think we all think it begins from something we take from here or there, it begins right here. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think so many studies, psychologists have studied this and neuroscientists have studied this, that internal motivation, right? If you have that motivation, it is so challenging to ignore it. And if you feel passionate about something, there are so many different ways you can express it. And I think that that's the beauty of a place like UCLA where you have so many different options. If you're an environmental science major, if you're an econ major, if you're an engineer, you don't have to stick to those traditional ways of expressing that aptitude or that expertise, right? And so I think- Very that much we really want to encourage students to take academic risks. Even if you are a great scientist, it doesn't mean you have to be a doctor, right? You can be other, you can express that scientific prowess in different ways. Absolutely. I was always told and I always wanted to be in the science and medicine that I couldn't do that. Um, I tell you now, I wish I had listened to him then. <laughs> so... And it, when I when I left school and I moved out to California, I was scared. You know, change is scary. And it, my dad said, Aaron, the only thing that's scary is not taking the, the risk and, and the, the challenge to yourself. If even if you fail, that will be your route to your greatest success. And you can you can always come back, but you're never gonna know. Yeah. If you don't do it. try. Until you do it. What brought you out to California? <laughs> So I laugh um, when I, again, you know, school is not my favorite thing. I, I did love school and I love school for a whole lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. The students, the teachers, I'm sorry, football games. Come <laughs> on. I was in college. Me, me too. No, me too. I was a cheerleader. I was in the sorority. I loved all that stuff too. I, I totally get it. Yes, I was pretty distracted. And so my dad said, yeah, we're going to have to shift some tracks here. And he said, Aaron, what do you like? Do what you like and you will succeed. Now, uh, my mom was um, a journalist and a sociology major, a very interesting combination. But I, I wanted to design. Uh, this has helped me in my career. I just think I, I've got an engineering gene that comes from my father. My whole family are engineers, but I also was girl and I liked fashion and all of that kind of stuff. So I ended up going to a fashion design school that brought me ultimately to California. Um, and I started my career at Kmart. That's what brought me to California. Um, honestly, you know, all, all, all the stores in, in Dallas that were taking me into that, my fashion design world, um, I don't know, they weren't paying enough, but I, I came West, if you will, and, and that's what started it all, and I didn't stay there long before I ended up working at Fluor Engineers and Constructors, and uh, I worked with, I'll never forget his name, Ramesh Ganatra on the Alaskan Pipeline, and um, it was terrific. But it was getting there, but see, taking that chance, getting here and where it started and moving to um, 
fluor engineers and constructors, it, it, it changed everything. And so you'll never know if you don't try. That's right. You don't know and you don't if you don't try. That's exactly And it's right. scary. It is scary. It's super scary. It's super I still scary. get scared today. In a timeline, I began my work in Inkley when I was 30. I'm now 60 and the grandmother of four. And I still have those moments. Yeah. You do? You still have those moments of being scared? Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. I've, and and it, uh, this is where I go back inward again and who I am. And, and I was having many conversations with myself about why I'm afraid, what I know, what I believe, and if I could just let my guard down and say to myself, it's okay that I'm scared. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. sometimes the things that make us more afraid are what make yeah. us yeah. try to do things better, right? I, I completely agree. Yep. So, oh yeah, no, I, I still do it, even at, even at my age. <laughs> yeah, right. We know that a hero is not coming. And, you know, that's, um, that's a perfect segue into something I was going to ask you about, which is your new book, which I, oh. I you, yeah, Superman, I think it's Superman's not, there it is. Superman's not coming. There it is. <laughs> one, one, I want to ask you um, the title and where that came from. And two, why is this book so relevant right now? Well, the title came from my work and um, I, I would be in communities and they, I always felt like I was the one dashing their hopes. And it oftentimes made me feel bad because they would say, well, the EPA or this agency is here and we're okay. And I'm like, mm, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but Superman's not coming. You know, no one's coming here necessarily to change or fix or magically make all this go away. But that's okay because you are here. The people, you are here. You are living this. You are breathing this. You are experiencing it. You can tell us so much that we don't know. And I began to see the disconnect between, you know, agencies and communities and, and not knowing what was going on or leaders, what was happening with the people. But see, we needed to show up. I said, you need to own this and you need to show up. And the minute they did, I'm telling you, it's a huge game changer. So the name Superman's not coming is about our national water crisis, but it can be applied to everything. You know, I learned early on in my life, by the way, that Prince Charming wasn't coming either, but that's another story. <laughs> so it's okay. We're here and we need to show up. So that's how it started. And in the book, we share definitely how the system works, how these chemicals work, how um, MCLs are set, uh, what the chemicals are, but we show you the communities mm -hmm. who rose up and see that was the game changer. And that's what's important about my title. It is Superman's not coming. It is a water crisis, but what we, the people mm -hmm. can do about it. And when they get in that mindset, I will show you in the book across the board, they rise up, they join their community, they will get to their local council, they make it their job to be involved and to act and to be proactive. And if every one of us did that in every community, every city council, think about that and the changes we can make and the solutions yeah, we would have across the board. It would be so transformative. But you know, what I think about is that especially with issues of water and the environment, people are intimidated, right? Like, oh, I'm not someone who knows about the way water works or the way that we get good water, you know, all the things. So how, how can people become versed in that enough to feel that they are empowered to have an opinion about it, to, to advocate for it or advocate against policies that are not serving people? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, I've had that post to me all the time. Water, water is complicated, but yet it's not. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm trying to think exactly what it is, where I want to go with what I want to say. I have a, I see, I can outthink myself on anything, and then it's just like a big old mess. But for me, <laughs> it, you know it, and when you're there, you're going to know it. Um, 
my work on water became a calling and I've been on a learning curve. There's days where my mind really, really hurts, but it's been worth it. Mm -hmm. and, and so ask me your question again, because I have my, like I told you, I was skipping around on a couple of things. Yeah, I want to get back I mean, to your point. How do people feel empowered even when they don't know the deal? So for example, so you know, as I said, I run a neuroscience lab and people have to know about how to code and how to program. And sometimes people right. get so intimidated with the detail that they, they forget about the larger questions. The question is, how does the environment shape adolescent development, for example? But the, the methods are that you have to learn how to do coding and computer programming. And people get so caught up in that that they forget, yep. you know, lose that. So how do you motivate or encourage people that they don't need to know the details of the chemistry of water, for example, to, in order to make a change in the advocacy of, of advocating for people for you know, healthy water and, 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 and other environmental issues? Well, it often begins because they themselves have found out they have a health issue or somebody in their family has been harmed. <laughs> And mm -hmm. through their support and wanting to help, they push themselves beyond what they think their limits are. Yeah. I would have never thought I could do what I've been doing with my dyslexia, but it became my gift because I actually work backwards. Mm -hmm. So I will take a calculation of a chemical in the water today and not extrapolate from that level forward. I start going back in time because I'm going to find a higher number, which starts to tell me over time at a higher level what really happened to these people. So you, I think we stress ourselves out and I'm perfectly, I, I'm, well, hello, I'm the first one in the class, I bet, to do that. Yeah. You know what? Relax and, and, and be open. Listen, if you're frustrated and I feel, I felt that, that, that cog in my wheel where in my brain that just gets stuck. Just take a second, take a beat because we put this pressure on ourselves. And I tell people that, in my communities. And it's something I've learned. It's something I've seen them go through and that they've learned. Standing in Hinkley, mm -hmm. I was told, you're not a doctor, you're not a lawyer, you're not a scientist, you're not this. What would you possibly know? And look, you don't have to know any of that to be a human, okay? Yeah. And if you're, if you're in that stuck moment, disengage from yourself for just a moment breathe and come back at it again. And it's, it's actually a normal feeling, but I think we get ourselves overworked. Um, we overthink. I do it all the time. Just for a moment, step back. Are you listening? And we, sometimes we keep doing this because we don't want to change or it's, it's what we think we know. And it's okay yeah. to try another way. Yeah. 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 I completely agree. And that, and that's okay, where, we, when you, when you want to be that advocate, uh, you'll know it, you'll feel it. Yeah. You care about the issue. So that's, what's going to be the most, probably the most important thing, right? A aside from the details that you do or do not know. And there's a lot of issues for us to be involved in, but don't think, expect, or assume mm -hmm. that just one way is the only way or think or expect or assume that somebody is magically going to give you the answer. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's okay, a challenge have, to yourself. We have a really interesting audience question that I hope you don't mind. Um, oh, no. Okay, I'll read it. Hello, Ms. Brockovich. I'm, I took an AP environmental science course in high school, and we spent a whole chapter discussing your work. That's exciting, which is fantastic. That being said, we ended the class feeling somewhat hopeless, oh, no, about the future of the natural world. Should we feel that way? If not, how do we change that mindset? I understand why you would feel hopeless. Um, you know, this, I cannot believe we're even having this conversation. I was doing my work back in 1991 in Hinckley. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought that maybe it was an isolated situation. Uh, it, was, it was disheartening to find out that it was an entire world in this situation. And so I get where you feel disheartened. And here we are, and you know, here we are at this moment where this conversation is more important and more relevant than it was back then regarding the environment. But this is an opportunity here 
right now, and I said earlier, and I, I couldn't be more sincere about this, hope is never diminished. Hope is here. We are having this great moment where, where we've, we are seeing the erosions and whatever we did to become where we are and who we are today, I guess was all good and well intended, but to keep blaming or going back over that gets us nowhere. Here we are and now we can see. So the hope is moving forward, we change antiquated systems or institutions or laws or policies because we've grown up and evolved and flourished into this new society, this new world that we see. And there's your hope because it's all right in front of us now and how we shift moving forward is what will change the game. So I would tell you, I understand your question and why you would feel hopeless. I shared with you eight years ago that I felt that way. I have more hope in this moment than I had eight years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, or 25 years ago, 27 years ago, when I stepped foot out in that small town of Hinkley, California. Wow. Wow. That's a really powerful statement to feel that right now, despite everything we've all undergone in the past year, that you feel that there's a lot of hope. Because we're here. We are rising. We are getting loud. We are seeing what we've seen and done isn't okay. And we're finding that courage and that voice. You know, this makes me think, I got to tell you, being from Kansas, the Wizard of Oz, mm -hmm. not the movie, the book. Mm -hmm. And if you ever, you can get on Google and study it. I find it fascinating because there's this whole political allegory to it. And I could get into it, but for the sake of time, most all of us know the story and Dorothy, you know, the house dropped down uh, on the, the munchkins in the land of Oz and they were all told to follow the yellow brick road. But you remember on that journey and really, if you have a chance, look at the political allegory and the meanings of the book and why L. Frank Baum wrote it. So L. Frank Baum wrote the book as a way to teach his children the power of individualism and thinking for oneself in a world that would increasingly begin to speak for you. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, that sounds very familiar. Mm -hmm. And this book was written at the pre-height of the Industrial Revolution. And I think that a revolution has been for us here is social media and how technology has blown up. And so the, the Tin Man was a representation of the American farmer who lost his heart because the banks were buying up all the land. The, the Cowardly Lion was a representation of L. Frank Baum's best friend, William Bryans Jenning, who was always running for president, but never had the courage. Had a lot of rhetoric, but never had the courage. And so we had the Tin Man, the Cowardly Lion, and the Scare... No, the Scarecrow was a representation of the farmer. The Cowardly Lion was a representation of industry worker who lost his heart. So here's the thing. They go to find the wizard, right? Which could have been a sitting president or that whoever that's going to give us the answer. The moral to the story then is where we're at right now. They got put to sleep and they woke up. Mm -hmm. Did we get comfortable? Did we get complacent? Was there a false illusion? What happened? But in the end, the moral is the same. See, we've now looked behind the curtain. We've seen the erosions. We've seen the errors of our ways. We're in that moment where we need to take accountability and own that and be okay with that so we can see how we move forward. What we are learning about ourselves is that we do have a heart. You have had that courage. You do have a brain. We have always had the ability to find our way back. But now we are awake. And I promise we're going to find our way and where we need to go. Chills. Aaron, that is so deep. I believe that. <laughs> I'll never see the same again. I'll never see the same again. It's okay. the book. It's a fascinating it allegory. Is. It is. Okay, I have another question for you from the audience. What advice would you give to someone who is part of a historically marginalized community but so desperately wants to follow a similar similar path of advocacy? Why well, again? Um, it, it, it'll begin with you uh, and, and believing that you can. Mm -hmm. I, 
I don't, I, it's hard to say, I mean, if without knowing like all of the circumstances or where you're at or where you're going, but again, don't, don't let yourself be marginalized and, and find that voice in yourself that you do have. And we just talked about that. And I think that we can hold ourselves back and I don't want you to do that. You know, you can, you can own it and be you just the way you are and, and get out there the first one step, one action, even the idea that you want to know how to get involved in that advocacy, um, talk to neighbors, talk to people in the community. We do have this great gift here of this, you know, internet. Um, I get on there and, and, and start just firing questions all day long, putting in zip codes, bringing stuff back. Don't be afraid to find out your own information. And when you do, you'll start recognizing patterns. Each one step you take will build you to the next place to get involved in that advocacy. So don't hold yourself back. I know that's what we do. I've just, I've seen it too often and I've experienced it. Uh, and you know what? Don't be afraid to ask a question. Don't be afraid to ask for support. Don't be afraid to say, I'm not sure. You know, I can't tell you how many times in the day somebody had asked me a legal question or a science question. I was like, I don't know, but you know what? I'm going to find out. And I'd pick up that phone. I'd pick up that encyclopedia. I'd go back to the law library. I'd call a scientist and don't be afraid to ask. Yeah. And say, I don't know. That's not my area of expertise. Right. You know, it's funny. Someone just said, she's the most amazing about you. She's the most amazing speaker I think I've ever had. The oh. of hearing she's so wow. real you are you are so real i mean you are so expressive and um representative of i think what people feel okay i have another question i know we're going to you. say one more thing another audience um question is how do you handle your fame and what have you learned from your success an interesting interesting article i came across in a class i'm currently teaching speaks to the importance of examining your success in fact, it is more important or as important as analyzing one's failures. <laughs> it's <That's> taken me, <laughs> I, I come in with a lot of wisdom that I certainly didn't know now. And I look back on Aaron Brockovich, I was terrified. Um, I'll never forget the night being on the red carpet. What talk about being overwhelmed. I wasn't prepared for this. Like no. I just, when, when you help others, you help yourself. And, and it, it just, I just did it. It was almost like a calling. And I was terrified um, on the red carpet. And Steven Soderbergh walked up to me that night. And as we were turning, he said, are you okay? And I said, no, I'm scared. Yeah. And he's just like, you're gonna have to get over it. How about now? And I just went out there and it was like, boom. And yeah. I was shaking so bad in the theater that the studio came up to me and said, if, if, you, we can't get you to stop shaking. I think it's going to be best if we take you home. Um, <laughs> you're, at, you're done. You're out of here. Yeah. I'll tell you what really overwhelmed me. Don't ever stand me in a first time experience like this next to Catherine Zeta Jones. I right. mean, it's like, okay, so <laughs> I'm leaving. Um, <laughs> my dad has a lot to do. He always taught me egos become our biggest stumbling block. Don't get out over those skis, Aaron. Remember why you were doing what you would do because you know we all have a role to play and film and television is a great way for, for us to, I don't know, escape for a moment from ourselves, but to check back in and go, you know what? I can be her, I can do that. I am her and you are her. And we all have, you know, I guess our own avatar that we can put on and, and we can go out and, and fight the world. So the, the film was great for that but I didn't do it for that reason. It was for the people and I've always stayed true to my cause. Yeah. And, and when you do, um, it's just, it's amazing what happens And that. That was my career path. And, and now we have Rebel on ABC mm -hmm. with Katie Seagal. I'm like, okay, so I'm not sure how this happened again, but um, it's a good message. And the time is right now mm -hmm. uh, about us and seeing who we are and accepting who we are. This is the greatest message of all. Are we all supposed to be different? I, I don't think any of us want to be anything other than different in ourselves and unique and put ourselves out there and embrace that. And it is the diversity. I see it in nature. Think about that. 
Yeah. And the system it has of all the different wildflowers and species and birds and all of that, it is that total diversity that makes the system work. Yeah. Exactly. And we have to bring, we are, this is where we are. It's like, hello. Yeah. And that's amazing. So just, you know what, Aaron Brockovich wasn't about me. Yeah. It's about all of us. Well, and that's, so that's, that's what, what we have so, to know. Yeah, that's what was so powerful. Of course you didn't set out to make a film starring Julia Roberts about this cause that was so important. It's because it was so important that it, 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 was what was picked up because it was so important, right? But you didn't set out to do that. And that's why- No, it, listen, it's powerful. Yeah. If I ever said to somebody, oh yeah, they're going to make a movie about me surrounding some environmental situation and Julia Roberts, I would have been in therapy a lot longer <laughs> than I was now. Come on. <laughs> exactly. Okay, well, I'm, uh, we have so many more questions, but I'm sadly, I'm really, I have 50 questions in front of me, but I really have to cut us off because- I don't want to go. I know. We, we can <laughs> hang out later and we can talk more about it, but um, right now I, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. A and he will um, close us out. But what time so is much. it? It's, it's seven. We've been, do, you know, we've been chatting for an hour. So we have to, we have I'm to- gonna be, I'm going to be sad to go. Me too. I'm going to be sad to see you go. This was just <laughs> phenomenal. This was incredible. I, I really, really, really enjoyed it. You know, I have to apologize to our audience for not getting to all the questions because some of them are very good. Some of them you answered, but I'm sure there were some that didn't get answered, but uh, we extend our apology. But also uh, a fabulous job moderating, uh, Adriana. This, this was a great dialogue, great exchange. We need to take this show on the road, maybe. I don't know, but it was great. I really, really enjoyed it. I want to say, you know, it was very inspiring. It was uplifting. You shared wisdom. You All the traits that Winston C. Doby would characterize in his own career and in his life. I mean, you really have fit the bill of this distinguished lecture series tonight. And we want to really, truly, truly thank you. I want, you know, I want to thank uh, not only Aaron Brockovich, but the Dobie family for allowing us to continue this legacy through AAP and through all these dynamic and incredible speakers that we've had. The UCLA community has been very supportive, very, very uh, supportive for attending and for supporting our students and our programs. Uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Raphael, one of our faculty advisory committee members, I'm glad you can make time to be here tonight, as well as Chancellor Block, Mrs. Block, we really appreciate you. And I want to thank the people behind the scenes. You don't realize oh, yeah. Aaron, how hard this was sure. for all these people, like Cassie and Yarell and all of them, Samantha, Joy, to put all these pieces together, contact people, line up a Zoom, get all this webinar stuff together. They do incredible work. And I, I want to extend my gratitude to them as well. So I want to, again, thank everyone. I realize we're at the end of the program. We may have gone over a little bit. But uh, it was worth it. It was worth every second, every minute of it. So thank you. Thank you so much. Just delighted to be here, everyone. I, I wish you well. Don't ever hesitate to call me. I want to come hang out in class down at UCLA. You can come to my class. You up on okay, I'm coming. There it is. <laughs> Send me an email because I'm going to be there. Someone I'm, said I'm, in the Q&A, someone said yeah. in the chat, she's, she is the literature professor of my dreams. <laughs> we'll bring you back. Definitely bring you back. Let's spend more time together. Um, and congratulations to everybody for everything that you do and the dean and chancellors and staff and students and alumni and the university. What a difference you make. Um, I'm proud and privileged and honored that I got to spend this time with you tonight. Keep Thank up you. the phenomenal movement forward you know I'll, I'll end this with makes me think of newton's law on inertia one of his first laws was objects at rest stay at rest objects in motion stay in motion that's us right. and we're going to move forward thank you great, so end. Much. great ending thank you good night good night good night, good night. Everyone.